Welcome to Weddings Unveiled, the podcast designed to help you build a productive, profitable wedding or event business. Here's your host, Angela Profit. Hi, y'all. Thank you so much for tuning in to this episode of Weddings Unveiled, professional tips and secrets on wedding planning and event design, where we take you behind the scenes of our past experiences in the industry and share with you what we have learned from them and how they have made us stronger. This podcast will help you grow a productive and profitable business to launch you into success within the hospitality industry. Team Flower is a worldwide network of floral professionals serving nearly 2,000 members across 34 countries, and you're invited to join the community. The 2019 Team Flower Conference is taking place March 4th through 6th in Waco, Texas, and you can head to teamflower.org slash podcast to learn more. At the Team Flower Conference, you can expect to hear stage presentations from industry leaders on inspirational and educational topics in both floral design and business, connect with fellow floral professionals and build lasting relationships in a supportive community setting, network with industry support, enjoy flower-themed celebrations, and receive encouragement for wherever you are in your journey with flowers. With both rich educational content and opportunity for true connection, the Team Flower Conference is a unique breath of fresh air in a fast-paced and competitive industry. Past attendees have described the event as food for the creative soul, amazingly relevant to all stages of floral professional development and a warm and welcoming family. Whether you're a wedding florist, a flower grower, a floral artist, or just someone who loves flowers, you're welcome here. That's something truly magical that happens when we all come together, and we'd love for you to join the Team Flower Conference. If you'd like to learn more, visit teamflower.org slash podcast for the latest information. Hi, y'all. It's Angela Prophet. Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of Weddings Unveiled. And today, I'm super, super excited to talk to the owner and lead designer, the flower guy, Bron. Bron, thank you for coming on. How are you? Oh, thank you for having me, Angela. I'm so excited to be here and chat with your community a little bit. Yay! If you guys don't know the flower guy, Bron, he is the flower guy. I, I was just at Wedding MBA, and um, I was asking Bron, I'm like, you're the flower guy. Like, you really branded yourself hard. And everyone was talking in the flower community. We were out for drinks one night, and they're like, I'm like, who are your favorite speakers today? And so many people, they're like, oh my God, this flower guy, Braun, was so great and engaging. So if you haven't seen him speak, you got to check it out. <laughs> oh, that is so cool. You know, you only hope that people, you know, receive and are open to what you're chatting about. And so that's great feedback. So thank you for sharing that. You made me feel good today. Yay. Well, I always like to share. Um, well, tell, for, for our listeners who don't know the flower guy tell us about your background how do you how do you even get started well that is such a loaded question and everyone <laughs> asks me and the answer is isn't so typical so unlike a lot of florists and designers i have no professional design experience I, i'm all self-taught now when i went to undergrad i went to school to be a teacher and oh. talk, talk, i know right I, <laughs> okay I, that, I know i went to school to be a teacher and had a very um, rewarding career in education, um, working with students with autism and, and other low incidence disabilities. And I just reached a point where I, I was, I knew that I was making an impact um, on the children and the teachers and the parents and the families, but I was not really doing anything that was feeding my soul. And I knew that burnout was right around the corner. So fortunately, when I was also an undergrad, I interned in a, in a flower shop. So that sparked my interest in flowers and something said, you know, Braun, take a leap and invest in yourself. And so I started the flower guy, Braun, and the rest was 
history. So again, no formal training, all totally self-taught. Um, I do invest in a lot of um, continuing education opportunities. So I'm, I'm well versed in my craft, but my background isn't so typical. I know a lot of my peers have been doing flowers for 20 and 30 years, but for me, it all started with going to the grocery store and buying flowers from my local market and putting them together for my home. And then realizing at some point, you know, you know, this isn't, you know, your $5 arrangement. Now the flowers may have cost $5, but what you're able to do with it is a little bit, a little bit more polished than, than the average, you know, person who's just throwing some flowers in the face. And so I decided to monetize that skill and, and here we are now. That's so awesome. It's funny because people, um, who you know years ago when I, I got into this industry and people would interview me, which I'm really interviewing them, <laughs> but um, <laughs> like I'll let them think that. Um, but they're like, Do you have are you certified in blah blah blah? And I'm like, No, like I think <laughs> that life experience and growing up around a family who had a wedding venue and going to school to be a psychologist and working in healthcare around crazy effing people ah. um, is way more qualified than like going to a six to eight week course online to teach me how to be a wedding planner. Like, um, yeah, that is funny. I've had, I've had um, potential clients sit in my, in my studio and say, Oh, you know, are you, did you go to school for this? I'm like, have you seen my Instagram? Who cares? You know? <laughs> exactly. It's like, my shit's beautiful. Like, yeah, I'm like, so yeah, over it. like, yeah, you know, it's funny. There's so many guides and, and questions to ask each vendor. And, you know, when I hear the questions, I'm like, Oh, I know what, I know what website they were on. I know where they got these questions. Uh -huh. So I just, I just, you know, thrilled them with experience and, you know, and just being confident in what we do and, you know, who cares about the formal training? Are you good or, are you, are, or aren't you? Yep. I can't wait to talk to you in a minute because I have a question <laughs> about the whole business thing because I didn't know what the hell I was doing either. Oh my um, goodness. But hey, as creatives, we figure it out, right? <laughs> every time, all day, every day. That is what we're here to do. Figure we're always learning. That's so right. tell us about like the actual wedding industry. Like, how'd you get into it? What was your first wedding like? And what's the difference like from when, you know, d your very first wedding to now? Like what's changed? Yeah, so it, it came across oddly and I know it was divine intervention. So a friend of mine from high school, I happened to run into her, I think it was in Nordstrom. And I was on one, one side of the rack and she happened to be on the other. And I heard her voice before I saw her. And I knew that it was her and I, I walked around the rack and I'm like, OMG, we had not seen each other in probably at least five or five to seven years. And so she had been actually planning weddings all of that time. And so she says, well, you know, oh my gosh, well, I'm planning weddings. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm teaching. And, you know, and at that time, teaching was still, you know, very rewarding for me. But my husband had just signed me up for a series of basic floral design workshops at our local botanical garden. Uh -huh. And so, right. So I was taking the courses and, you know, was already inspired by flowers from undergrad. And I said, well, you know, it's so funny. You know, I'm taking these courses. And she said, you know what, Bron? I have a bride. And I'm like, well, what are you telling me this for? Like I told you, I, I'm, I'm a teacher and, you know, I'm taking some intro level design courses. And you know, so what about this bride? And she says, well, you know, she, she needs flowers and, you know, she doesn't have a very large budget. And this could be an opportunity to kind of get your business started. And so I said to myself, well, I don't quite know about that. I, I'll, I'll give it a thought. And from there, I gave it a little bit more of, of a thought. And from there, I had my first wedding. And it is just, I, I look back on it, and I had never had a formal consultation. I didn't have any of my legal documents prepared. I was not a, a valid business in the state of Virginia. Um, it was just everything was on a whim. And I was just flying by my, by my coattail. And I'm just like, okay, I'm just going to make it work. And so I, I called my mentor. And I told her, I said, Sidra, you'll never believe, but I have a floral consultation. She's like, what? So she kind of walked me through some of the questions to ask and I, I winged it and I booked the client. And so that first wedding, when I look back at it, scale wise, it was much larger than, than anything that a, a 
first time designers should have ever had. I think that Brian had about 250 guests in a large ballroom with about 10 topiary arrangements. And wow. so it's so funny. Right. And when I look <laughs> back at the work and then I compare it to my current work, I, gosh, you can't even hold a light to the stuff. Right? That I was doing. <laughs> I, my, my team actually jokes and says, Brian, you remember when, remember when we were designing opiaries, not topiaries? Oh, and so, my God. I love it. I <laughs> love know, it. They're like, you know, you remember when your topiary would fit in a bin? And I'm like, yeah, and now, and now you got to prop them up on, on stools practically to, to get them done. But um, I just look back and I'm like, oh, my gosh, thank goodness for growth. Because what we were doing back then, we're definitely not doing now. But, what I, but, but the good thing about that is acknowledging the growth from where you started to where you are. Yep. And that's, that's a big a part of, of my brand and how I, I'm really, really desperately trying to appeal to new businesses and, and medium-sized businesses that are, are still growing. Not, not the business that is already booming and doing you know, millions of dollars worth of business. Those aren't the people who really need to hear my story and my words. My words are more for the aspiring business owner, the struggling business owner, the people who wonder every now and then, am I on the right track? And, I, and my answer is yes. Because I look at where I started and how I have stayed focused and steadfast in my business. And I look at where I am now. So if it can happen for me, it can happen for anybody. I love it. Well, and I think that a couple things that you have touched on, I don't know if you realize it, but it's like you realized your passion was going away as a teacher. And so um, like I, I wasn't a school teacher, but I taught gymnastics and I yeah. loved teaching and leading. And even though they were little kids and I was like, put a bubble in your mouth. And really yeah. I meant like, shut the fuck up. <laughs> and then I'm like, sit crisscross applesauce or like, I'm going to hit you. And this is why I don't have kids, real kids, but they're really not. I would be like being in jail for child abuse and like put tape on their mouth. It's so bad. But like, I love like fostering kids and like helping them. And when I say kids, I mean like people in college, like interning and like helping them find their way because absolutely, I did a lot of internships and externships and that's what helped me understand what I like to do. Um, but you saw that, that the passion was going away and you followed your heart into happiness of like, absolutely. okay, the flowers make me happy. And it's almost like God dropped that planner in your Absolutely. life. You were in the right store at the right time. And it was a relationship that pulled you into it. And it seems like 99% of the people who are super, super just amazing, well-known professionals in this industry, we weren't like, we didn't go to school for this. Like it's more about a passion. And I want to talk about how, you have made your passion into a profitable business because that's one of the biggest struggles is I see, and I know you see it too, that people are leaving money on the table and they don't understand how to communicate their value. And it's a craft. It's not just a passion. Yes, we love what we do, but at the same time, I want to have one job. I don't want to have a nine to five stable job and then run this crafty hobby business when I can focus on that craft and that passion and freaking make a good ass living. Right. So can you share with us like what, I mean, this is just so perfect because you weren't trained for this. Like mm -hmm. how in the hell have you figured it out? <laughs> well, that's a, such a loaded question. I'm right. Gonna to, I'm going to try to like plunk and chunk it and just kind of whittle it down a little bit. So, you know, when, when I was working professionally, everything was very, very um, charted and scheduled. There was no abstract to, um, abstractness to it, you know, but when I decided to leave my professional teaching career and go over to entrepreneurship, um, everything was foreign and I, I had no concept of what it was like to have to really work for your money and to have to earn your money and to have to really show your value and to demonstrate something special because you're not the only person who does what you do. You have to be in a position to, to demonstrate something special as to why people should come to you. And so what I, what, I dial, what I did is I had to dial back and think about, Braun, who are you as a person and, and, and what is your appeal? What is your give to the community that you'll be serving? And so in order for me to answer that question to myself, I really had to think about, well, who the hell are you, Bron? Well, I was, I 
outside outside of Braun and Braun Hands, Bro, the flower guy, Braun, or all the things that people call me, who are you? And when I really thought about that question over a few days, the answer overwhelmingly became your relationship builder. Yep. And so you're a person that that people connect with. You're a person that's passionate about helping. And, and it's not all about the money. And so as my mom always told me that if you always focus on money, you'll never have it. That's and right. so my, my thought has always been, Ron, if you do your best work and if you stay genuine and true to who you are, that will show through your consultations and through your designs and people will gravitate to those factors about you. And so that is how I have been able to establish my business. I had to go back and think about who are you as a person and how does that being relate to other people. And so just been fortunate and, and full of grace and favor to, to be able to, to have that appeal, that mass appeal and for people to receive and accept my work. And so that 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 is the secret sauce. The secret sauce is being genuine and, and really being a reflection of who you are and letting that speak through your work. So that that's the magical side of everything. But then outside of the magic, there there are some some strategies to it and, and things that you know, that you can do as an actionable takeaway um, to help develop and grow your business. And so some of those things that we've done is we've just literally something as simple as sitting down and writing down your goals. I mean, that that is so invaluable. If you cannot put a dollar amount on, you know, putting things on paper and assigning timelines to them. For example, I worked out of my home for several years before we invested in studio space. And, you know, I said, you know, at the end of, you know, X month, I want to be in the studio. So all of the goals that I needed to achieve or the things I needed to check off of that list to make that dream happen, I had to work and focus on those. So it's a mixture of strategy and a mixture of, you know, faith and, and just being a good person and putting out good energy and it coming back. That's so awesome. You have a good mama. We have good mamas. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> she's, she's pretty cool. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, I could not... I mean, agree with her and you more. It's like, do your passion and then do the right thing, have morals and values and put your creative all into it and the money will come. Absolutely. But I will say that without, for me, without having um, a real accountant and like a <laughs> business manager and hiring and investing in several mentors and coaches and strategists and taking business classes and getting, um, I went through a group called Catalyst, which was like an accelerated mm -hmm. MBA specifically on business. Mm -hmm. And I did that maybe eight or nine years ago and it completely changed my life and it changed everything. But the most important thing, and I don't know if you feel this way too, but it helped me say no and feel very confident in, in saying, no, this is not a good fit. You're looking for something that is cheap and we provide value. And we look at, um, you know, we don't need 200 weddings a year to make it. We can do 30 um, mm -hmm. who people who want to invest their money in an experience and they value our process and that's okay. And so once I started that model and just like you said, writing down goals and writing down and goals are like things that are measured by time or money and you got to give yourself an end date. You've got to block it on your calendar and treat it just like it's a client. And you would never set a client up and not show up. So why would you do not do it for yourself and your own business, right? Absolutely. So it's just, um, you know, without having that business guidance over the years of understanding how to charge um, and how to track hours and how to grow with a team and how to get space, you know, you don't have to figure it out all by yourself. Like, no. it sounds like you've invested in coaches and consultants and education to make sure Absolutely. that you are doing it at least what we think is the right way. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, and some of it's trial by fire and trial and error, but you're, you're spot on and, and you did, you did, you did hit on a few things and I, all of which I have done myself, you know, the continuing education opportunities, investing in myself and accountant, business coaches, all of those things have, have added to, to my success, to the, to the success, excuse me, of the flower guy, Braun. So you're spot on, you know, it, it, of course, it's all about, you know, your energy, but then the strategy behind it, all of those things are very, very meaningful in developing your business. So anybody that's, that's considering doing it, or even if you're already in business, never, never cut corners on investing in yourself. 
And so you, you, you hit the nail on the head. Amen. So what, before we jump in, cause I, I have a couple questions about the brand, but let's talk about the client side. Like what would you say is super unique about how you do it? And what is it that your clients love about that? Okay. So we're very, very careful about how we navigate our clients to the creative process. We, we identify as creative that we are creative and everyone is, else isn't. And so that, that is something that they are coming to us for. They're coming to us for our intellectual property. They're coming to us because they know that what we do, they can't do without us. And so because we know we're in that, in that really, really valued space for most of our clients, um, we're, we're careful about our touch points and how how we navigate them. So, for example, you know, we get a you get, we get a um, email or a call, and so you know, from the moment that we we make contact with that client, you know, it, it's the, the turn on the luxury, turn on the attention to detail, turn on all of the things that our clients are booking us for. So when we bring our clients in, it's a very unique process where, you know, we do a full design presentation. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're listening. And that's, that's something I probably should have said first. We listen, we mm -hmm. listen, we listen, we listen. We try to talk as little as possible. Now, of course, you're going to do small talk and you're going to, you know, be relatable and you want to, you know, have those those moments where they feel comfortable with you in conversation. But what's most important is that we're listening and we're picking up on all of the subtle nuances that come through conversation. And so I have a notepad and I'm just jotting down a thousand notes. And sometimes I, they look at me like, How, have I said enough to have, <laughs> have two, or, two or three pages worth of notes? I'm like, well, you might not think that you have, but I'm taking notes of everything, mental notes of what they're wearing. I'm taking notes of, you know, the places that they say to travel, you know, the things that, that make them who they are, the things that I'm looking for so that I can understand them in design. And so I think that it's our, our ability to listen and hone in on what the design needs are and be intuitive. And that that's something, you know, when clients don't have to ask you a ton of questions where you can kind of help connect some of those dots without even asking, you know, and so I try not to, you know, make them feel overwhelmed with a laundry list of, you know, well, how many of this and how many of that? And where are you going to put this? Where are you going to put that? What do you think about this? My goal is to get an overall big picture. Once I understand exactly what the client is looking to create big picture wise, then I can take that and, and throw the flower guy bronze custom spin on it and create something that is branded and bespoke just for that couple. And I think that that's what sets us aside. You know, our consultation process is, 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 is unique. You know, the way we kind of hold our client's hands throughout the process and then just the confidence that our clients see in me and my team that we're able to get the job done. And so I think that that is probably what sets us apart from some of our creative partners that do, you know, floral and event design in our market. Um, and, and then, you know, again, there's always that magic sauce of the flower guy brawn. I think that, you know, some people are even uh, um, appeal, appeal to the fact that, that I'm a guy. You know, there aren't that many uh, male floral de designers. Now, I know a few because, you know, I'm in the community, but it is an anomaly most often to come to a design studio um, for flowers and meet with a guy. So I think that, that that even has some appeal behind it. But overwhelmingly, I do believe that it's the fact that we listen, the fact that we have an intuitive level of service, and, and we try to make sure that we're really meeting not only the design needs of our clients, but also the emotional, physical, and all of the support that they're going to need to get through this process successfully. I love it. I love it. Which this is a great like lead into, I know like tell us about, I mean, I'm sure everyone listening has heard about Saks Fifth Avenue versus Saks Off Fifth. Say that five times. Saks Off Fifth. Saks off, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> um, so tell us like, what is your approach and what is the difference to these brands? All right. So I, I have two distinct brands, um, one being the Flower Guy Braun, which, are, which is our bespoke and our signature design services. And then we have Saks Alfith, which is our pastel posy line. And I developed that line because when I started my business, of course, my price points were much lower. I'll be embarrassed to tell you how much I charged that bride for 10 Hopiaries and probably 20 other table designs. <laughs> 
it probably wasn't even twenty five hundred dollars. You may have lost money. <laughs> <laughs> just, ma- just maybe lost a few dollars. Yeah. <laughs> and so when we started there, you know, for several years, we kind of hovered in, you know, a more moderate price point. But then as I started to, again, seeking that continuing education and investing in myself and realizing just how valuable my work was, I decided that I needed to have something um, to offer my clients that were still in those more modest price points while my business continued to soar to different price, to much higher price points. And so I never wanted to lose focus of where I started, who are the brides that, that gave me the experiences, you know, who, who were the first two or three hundred brides that we served that made me understand what a luxury service should look like. And so I never wanted to to just, you know, continue to soar in my career and my designing and then be unaccessible to the people who started my business. So that that is what I have. I have the Flower Guy Braun, which represents Saks Fifth Avenue. And then I have Pastel Posies, which represents the Saks Off Fifth business model. And what that allows me to do by having these two different brands, it allows me to market very specifically to two totally different brides, grooms, and couples. So I'm able to market my luxury services, put out those luxury images and attract those brides, but then for the brides who who are either not interested in making that type of investment or just can't, but still want a high level of service, they're able to access my pastel posy line, still have beautiful flowers without all of all of the fuss that goes into some of the more um, expensive designs. And so that that's pretty much how we do it. And basically, you know, you call, we talk, and if I feel like, you know, you know, there's some some signs being given that we're looking for a more modest investment point, then I can just refer that business right back to me without saying, you know, I have a mandatory minimum, you know, I really, you know, I don't work under a certain price point. So instead of saying that I offer a product for those prices so in that way I'm not leaving money on the table that's right going back to our title it's like if I had drums I'd be like <laughs> <laughs> some I need some drumsticks and a bell <laughs> yeah um but just so our clients or our, our like listeners and, and your clients understand, like you have a team, right? Like Absolutely. you're not running all like no. both brands by yourself. So talk to us a little bit about how you vet your team and do you have a separate team that works on one brand versus the other. And do they have more experience and do yes. you train them? Tell us how that part of the behind I'm- the scenes works. I'm so glad you asked that. So in order for this to be profitable, in order for me to have a subsidiary brand that caters to a less um, costly or a less um, a smaller price point, I had to think about Braun. What are things when you walk into Saks Fifth Avenue, what do you expect? And the answers are, I expect it to be in a, a you know a, a beautiful setting. I expect to be approached by multiple um, you know people to see if I need services. I expect to you know have samples. I expect for a really 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 high level of service, and the aesthetic yep. is totally different. But then when you think about Saks Office or any of the you know more um, you know the, the lesser brands for any of those signature stores, they're always generally going to be in a strip mall. They're going to be in an outlet mall. They're not going to be you know you're not going to have plush carpeting and marble and, and escalators is going to be you get what you get you walk That's in right. it's going to be a ton of racks everywhere and your those racks are still going to be full of Gucci, Fendi, Versace, Prada and all of those luxury brands however they're just not packaged the same way and so in order for me to keep my pastel cozy line economical I had to realize that Braun you can't touch it as much of a control freak as I am <laughs> I had to dial back and say, you know what, Bron, how much does it cost you per hour? What what does it cost you per hour to do anything in your in your studio? And that price is much more expensive than it is for me to hire a designer, you know, at, at, at a much lower price per hour to design these collections. And so I have a team that is dedicated to my subsidiary pastel posy brand. And so that team gets the set recipe that I have already created. I've trained them on exactly what to do and how to do it. Um, All of the glassware is already predetermined. The recipes, like I said, are predetermined. So all they have to do is come in and design them very easily and very quickly. 
And that's how I'm able to keep the price points down. Now, for the flower guy, Braun, of course, you know, the designs are more custom and a higher level of designing, which require me to be in the weeds with my team. But I do have a team totally dedicated to my subsidiary brand, which helps me keep the cost down. And so how how did you learn how to understand what things cost? Well, thank goodness for continuing education. You know, it's so funny. I tell a story. When I first got started in floral design, you know, you, you don't really want to let too many people know what you don't know. Mm-hmm. And so, so, you know, you find yourself falling on your face time after time, just, you know, just trying to figure things out. And as I was developing my pricing, I, I at that point, didn't even really know about wholesalers. So I was, you know, buying flowers from a wholesaler, but they also, they sold to the public. So I wasn't really getting those true wholesale farm direct pricing. And I kept trying to figure out, well, when you do your markup, you know, how on earth, why are you so expensive? Why are you like, three times as expensive as your competitor. Cause you know, I would have clients come in, they'll say, well, you know, you're, you're, you're pricing, you know, you're just, you're just, you know, you're the, at the top of the market. I'm just like, well, I know my design at that point was definitely not the top of the market. <laughs> so I couldn't figure out why in the hell my prices were so high. And then I realized, you know what, Brian, you're not doing your due diligence. And it was just sheer ignorance. I didn't know. And yeah. so then I realized, okay, Brian, you need to start you know, demanding lower prices and buying from places um, that have, you know, better incentives for their customers. And so from there, I was able to get my price points down and just trial and error. I just learned trial and error. And then luckily, there have always been a few kind well, several kind faces in my industry that I could turn to for advice. And that's another thing that I always encourage people, you don't know until you ask. You might think, you know, oh my God, you know, I like what the flower guy Braun does, but if I had a question, I could never ask him. The reality of the matter is that I'm up all night on Instagram, Facebook, and every social media platform and responding to people's simple questions. So, you know, I asked around and people were like, you know, well, for hard goods, you know, this is a standard markup. For flowers, this is a standard markup. And I started incorporating a lot of that information. And then I realized that my pricing was coming down and being more streamlined and appropriate with my market. But then as my designs increased and as the flower guy became much more popular and, and more of a destination design studio, then of course our prices adjusted to, to reflect that as well. You know, you gotta, gotta pay for a little bit of the fame. So, so that, that has changed slightly, but you know, overall it's just trial and error and then asking questions and just learning. Yeah. And I will say what, you know, clients who, again, they think are, you know, clients, they, potential clients they think they're interviewing us and they're Mm -hmm. like well we've met with these other people and what are your packages and i'm like oh (laughs) it doesn't work like that and i don't care who you met with but we have a business model and a strategy and a process and it works and we've been doing it a long time and you're investing in experience and psychology and technology and design ideas and you pay for that like that shit don't come for free absolutely and i remember it doesn't does it? I feel, like, I, I feel like I can talk more candidly with you, Angela, because, you know, um, you know, uh, fortunately and unfortunately, I think that, you know, we all would want to be in a place that, you know, our clients are no longer shopping. But I listened to a podcast from like the esteemed Preston Bailey a few weeks ago, and even clients shopping for services at his level are mm-hmm. still shopping. Yep. And so what I realized is that if they're sitting on my sofa in my studio, that means that they've already done some level of due diligence. They have already decided that I can do what it is that they want. Mm-hmm. And I also keep a, a good enough finger on the pulse of my market, my local market, and even the markets around me to know that, that out of everyone that I would say would be my, uh, I guess for lack of better words, my competition, I know that they don't do it quite the way I do. So yep. if you're sitting here and you're telling me, oh, I've met with, you know, you know, I have met with two other designers and you're the most expensive. I'm like, well... I also probably know who you've met with, and I can tell you probably why I'm more expensive. I'm probably more expensive because of the service that I'm offering. Yep. You're, you're paying for a high level of design. You're paying for my intellectual property. You're paying for your access to me. You're paying for a team that is well-trained and professional. You're paying for high-quality flowers that have been sourced from all over the world. 
world. You're paying for not a team that's not only going to set up, but they're going to come back and strike. You own your glassware, so feel free yep. to take anything at the end of the night. And then we also have a concierge service where we'll deliver your flowers to the nursing home of your choice. So Amazing. that is why you're paying top dollar because you're at Saks Fifth Avenue. Right. <laughs> I love it. Like whenever some people, and again, they're not like trying to be cheapskates. They just truly are trying to understand the pricing because we, we do Absolutely. planning and logistics. And as you know, planning and logistics has nothing to do with creative design. No. And it's two I, different services. <laughs> yeah, I spend a lot of time when I'm onboarding clients um, talking about well, better yet, educating them. And that's where, mm -hmm. you know, people say, well, how has your career in education, how has that impacted flowers and nothing alike? I said, well, actually, I'm able to do quite a bit of teaching in my consultations and while I'm onboarding clients. Because like you said, people have no concept of what flowers nope. and what weddings cost. And so for me, it's, it's important to set the expectation early in the process. So so that my clients don't have to wonder, well, I mean, well, well, why is his delivery fee $500 or $1,000? I'm like, well, you know, you have 20 tables and, you know, and 10 of those tables have 10 pieces of glass on them that all have to be hand polished. And, yeah. you know, th those things don't come cheap. And, you know, and I have a team that comes in, you know, I hire people to come in and polish glassware. And, and, and so it's just, it's a thing. And so they understand, you know, that, that picture is the, the glass. That's not an edit. Like that, those glasses are really polished that well, mm -hmm. you know, and, and the things that go into their, their design. And honestly, I've seen parents who have been on the fence about pricing and don't quite understand. They say, well, you know, 30 years ago, we paid $500 for flowers. And then, you know, when I finish explaining to them the service that they're getting, and for and, and overwhelmingly, I see the guard come down and they become proud that they are hiring a florist or designer that takes that much pride in their event. And it makes them feel like an even more gracious event host. And so, you know, that education piece is so, so important um, with us, with our clients and just uh, helping them understand where their money is going. They're buying um, an experience. They're not buying flowers. So, you know, it's, it's, it's just like you said, you know, it's not, it's not <laughs> just a simple, you know, we're not just coming in, throwing on, throwing flowers on the table. It's an experience. Absolutely. And it's funny. We had a wedding the day after Thanksgiving and people are like, oh my God, why would you do that? And I'm like, oh my God, it was one of my amazing clients who works at a music industry firm who mm -hmm. all of their clients they get married we do the wedding they know that they can trust us we're not going to take advantage of who they are or their money I don't care who you are half the time I don't know who you are um, and so her sister was getting married and um, I of course would like would make it work and I don't care what day of the week it is half the time I don't know what day of the week it is but <laughs> true, true. they they were were just like oh my I mean I think we planned the wedding in like a month or something um and people were like oh my god like how much does this cost and how much does that cost and her you know I have a relationship with the sister and she's like don't worry about it like Angela and her team, like they'll take care of everything. Like just tell her what you like. You like this or you don't like this. She's like, don't worry about the cost. We understand the level of service that we're going to get and we have to worry about nothing. Yeah. And so it's amazing that, you know, social media is great. It didn't exist when I started. And, right. but for us, like word of mouth is still the most powerful way because we create an experience just like you do. Um, like, would you, what is your number one resource, resource of like referral these days, like yes. with all the platforms? Yeah. So overwhelmingly, um, we, we are getting the majority of our inquiries directly through social media. And I'm so grateful for it because mm -hmm. I know years ago, businesses did not have that edge and free marketing. And so uh, overwhelmingly. Commonly, Instagram and Facebook, um, we get a ton of referrals and then followed by word of mouth and planners and venues. And so we have we pay a lot of attention to our venues and we pay close attention to our, our planners and making sure that we're nurturing those relationships in our city um, because we want to be 
the first name that comes out of any planner, any venue's name when a, when a client asks about flowers. And so we're fortunate to, enough to have really, really great relationships with a ton of planners who bring us their brides and a ton of venues who refer. And, you know, and I tell people, I said, well, I, I can't necessarily say that the venues and the planners are only telling their clients about me. And I don't necessarily even want that per se, because I think a fair amount of competition is healthy. It keeps us all sharp and on our toes. But what it does do is it gives me, it narrows down the list as opposed to a bride going to a venue and having, you know, 10 floors on a list. It's better for me to be on that list, but also come out of the mouth of the planner at that venue. So that helps narrow down that search. And so same with same with planners, you know, overwhelmingly when a planner brings a client and refers a client to me, it's just, you know, it's just a matter of me selling the relationship at that point. The planners already vouch for the quality of the service. It's just a matter of, of the relationship building. So overwhelmingly it's word of mouth, it's planners, it's venues, and it is social media. Yep. And consistency too, right? <laughs> like Tell me consistent. about it. Yeah, absolutely. So tell us a little bit about like the public perception of your brand and like what people see about mm -hmm. you, your team, your two different brands. But yeah. talk to me a little bit about the public perception of just branding. Absolutely. So I, I am a consumer of a lot of things. I love to shop and I pay attention to what's going on everywhere that I am and how brands relate to me. And so one of the things that I'm very, very cautious about is making sure that when, when I created the Flower Guy Braun, that it was not, although a luxury service, that it never came across so elitist that it was not, that someone wouldn't feel like we were accessible. And, and part of part of why I have the sex off, sex off fifth in the pastel posing model is for this reason. I never wanted to come across as the mandatory minimum florist where, you know, if you're not, you know, in the clouds, you know, five, you know, five, six figure price point that, that you, I was not the florist for you. I wanted to always make people feel comfortable about who I am and what I can do for them. And so that, that was very, very key for me in making sure that my brand was was perceived to be and naturally is accessible to all people. Um, I think in our industry, because we don't have a, the typical corporate structure, you know, we don't have, you know, vice presidents and CEOs, you know, I, even though we're all CEOs of our own small businesses, mm -hmm. we don't have that, that particular place where we reach, um, where we've made it per se. So I think what we've done is we've labeled the luxury side of things as that we've made it moment. And so I wanted to be very, very careful, not only with how clients see my business, but also how my fellow vendors in our hospitality industry see my business. And so I never wanted to be that vendor on a stage or, or anywhere talking about only a certain type of client or a certain type of price point. I've always wanted to make sure that I was, again, appealing to everyone in the middle and everyone at wherever we think the bottom is. I don't really think there's a bottom. I think there's, there are people, somebody for everybody. Um, you know, when I, when I think about, you know, where I started as a designer, that might be where someone plateaus or finishes as a designer. Everyone can't be everything. And so for me, I want to make sure that I'm never stepping on toes or making another business or bride, groom, or couple feel inadequate because of a price point. Um, I feel like, you know, price points, of course, you know, the fewer weddings I work at a higher price point, the easier my life is. But I also recognize that there's some people who are, are who, whose businesses are based on volume and people that never aspire I have, um, to have a luxury price point. I have a great friend, Diane Newton, out of New Orleans. She owns Fat Cat Flowers, and she does not ever want to touch, touch a luxury wedding. She soars in that five to $6,000 price point. She generates over a half a million dollars in business every year. So who am I to say, because I work weddings with a $50,000 price point or more, then who's to say that my business is better than her business? So it's not. It's all about running a, a, a well-oiled machine mm -hmm. and appe a, appealing to the bride, groom, or couple that you're supposed to appeal to 
and doing your best work. And so that is what I hope my public perception is, or the public perception is of the flower guy, Braun, is the accessibility, universal accessibility. So well said, my friend. Thank you. Amazing. You know, and I've I struggled, honestly, I've struggled over the last few months and even maybe the last year with how vocal I wanted to be about this message because it, it's not a message that is necessarily universally accepted. You know, a lot of times, you know, once once we get on that luxury track, you know, we really, it seems to me that, you know, we, we're, we're trying to pull everybody to luxury. And I'm just like, well, what about the bride who has $10,000 to spend on her wedding? She's never going to be a luxury client. And what about the vendors who are serving her? Maybe they're in a small town. Maybe maybe the brides just don't have it. So, like, let's leave those folks alone. Let, let them be great and let them do their best work in whatever price point they're at. And, you know, I'm like, okay, how, how are my peers going to feel about this? But for me, what's more important is how are the people hearing the message going to respond to it? And I think that I'd rather encourage, you know, 10,000 a million than appeal and, and be a part of the, the small group who is just focused on luxury. Yeah. And again, like a lot of people, in fact, I was on a panel a couple years ago speaking with Preston and um, a couple girls were standing up and asking questions and one girl stood up and she's like, I think that all your work is beautiful, but like we don't do things like, like we don't have Oprah as a client. And so when you first started, like, can you get, I mean, she just flat out said it. She's like, can you get back down to our level and yeah. share with us? Like yeah. how, Listen. like, how the hell did you get here? And yeah. like, I actually chimed in like from the psych side and I said, even before Preston answered and I said, well, actually Preston is here as our keynote speaker and to share with us where, what he's currently doing. And so to take it a step back, um, you know, we've all been there. We've all started at a starting point. And I mean, I did weddings for free for fun for two years at, at a local church. Yeah. And so, but you have to grow into these things. And I think mm -hmm. what Preston's trying to say, because I think it was a very disrespectful towards him, in my opinion. I'm like, what I think he's trying to say is like, the sky is, there. there's no limit. And like, if you want to work your brand into doing these types of things, then don't like, don't put a limit on yourself. However, you have to surround yourself with people on the business side and the creative team side to get to this point. You can't do it all alone. And, um, and then he's like, yes, what, what, what she said. <laughs> right. But you know, it's, it's funny you I mentioned see. that. I think it's all about how you say things. And I think, yep. I think what, what our main stages are missing is perspective. And I, I think what, what, the, what the audiences are yearning for and what I'm hearing across the country when I speak and the people who stay back to ask me questions and, you know, uh, what I'm hearing is that they want to hear the story. They want to hear the story behind the giant. And yep. so, and so I think that that's probably what she was going for. I think to do it to a main stage keynote, probably not the right time. Yeah, not the right time. But I, I but I think it goes to show what people are yearning for. And, you know, I, I, I know for me, when I first started going to conferences and, you know, I was still in those, in those more modest price points for my business. Um, you know, I'm like, oh my gosh, like, what am I doing wrong? Like, how, how on earth am I ever going to get there? So I think, you know, as much as, as much as it's important to know the now and the trends and, and what we're doing now at the top, I think that those stories and how to get there is so important and people are yearning to hear people relate to them mm -hmm. and say, you know, well, 10 years ago, I was doing the same thing you were doing. Yep. And, and, and they're yearning to leave with the inspiration to be able to stay the course and, and continue to grow their business. Yep. Yeah. I mean, and, and again, it's funny. I was talking to someone earlier and she was saying how they started at like a faux Instagram where it's like, you know, mm -hmm. you, you know, have all the pretty in the grid with the company and then, you know, you like go offline and it's like, okay, my life's not always pretty and my hair doesn't always look perfect and my makeup's always not perfect and my clothes aren't perfect. And so um, that's what we've kind of used Instagram story, story stories for is just to like, this is not always real life. Like 
shit needs to seem perfect to the client in the front, but in the back, it's not always perfect. But since we've done that and like just been very real, our engagement's gone up because people are like, oh, okay, they're not robots. They're not, you know, they are mm -hmm. relating to it. So. Absolutely. Have you noticed, I, well, I know I've noticed is I can post pictures of flowers all day long and get, you know, a, a nice engagement. But when I post a picture of my Thanksgiving dinner spread or a picture of me doing an everyday task, the engagement goes yep. through the roof. People are yep. looking for stories. People are looking to see who we are as people yep. so that they can connect with us. Yep. It's so, so, so true. I just, um, I just never thought anybody gave a shit. <laughs> no. I'm like, I mean, I, I did it. And then like some of my interns, like at the end of their internship, they're like, I'm like, okay, what did you learn about yourself? And what did you learn about us? And like, I kept hearing the same thing. They're like, well, we thought that you were just like this robot and we were so intimidated, but like, you're so <laughs> not like that. But online you seem like this, like drill sergeant. I'm like, but we mean business, but shit, we have fun. Like, otherwise right. I wouldn't take this risk every day of my life. Like, okay. you know, like, so <laughs> going back from like, you know, when you got started to now, like what are, what's the biggest challenge that you see coming up for the wedding industry, you know, going into a new year and, um, We'll talk about what's next for the Flower God, Ron. Yeah, but absolutely. do you see, like, what's your biggest challenge right now? Well, my biggest challenge is always managing burnout. And I think that I'm not the only person that, that deals with burnout. The nature of what we do is so mentally, physically, and if you're spiritual, even spiritually taxing. And so for me, it's always trying to find the balance of everything. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that I'm, I'm doing for myself is, you know, really, really soaking up a lot of inspirational messages and really trying to make sure that I keep myself really full and whole so that I can continue to provide the level of service that my clients require. And so I think that, you know, as an industry as a whole, we are so super focused on actionable takeaways, which I get. You know, when people go to a conference, you know, we have been trained in the conference world to, to only focus on actionable takeaways. What are people going to walk away with that will allow them to model exactly what it is that you're doing and make more money. And so well, I think that that can tend to be a hamster in a wheel or a rat race. So instead of people leaving with inspiration from a, a conference or from continuing education, they're generally leaving with a book full of notes and more stress about how to apply a lot of these things. So one yep. of the things that Think about it. It's true, right? So, I mean, I've, I've gone to a thousand conferences and I filled the notebooks that they give me up, give me full of notes. And then I get home and I sit down and I'm like, how in the hell am I going to manage all of these things? Like, I'm barely managing now. I went to this conference. I have all this information. And nine times out of ten, they're not able to implement it. So right. I, think, I think what we have to do as the industry and as educators and as leaders and what my goal is and how I'm trying to, to move forward um, in the industry and help others is to provide that shining light, to provide that motivation and that inspiration with an educational twist and, and change the way that we provide continuing education so that we as an industry can continue to be steadfast and move forward and, and, and be creative. Now, who can be creative when they're stressed? So we need to really take some of that, cre that creativity and change the way that, that we offer um, support to our community, to our, our community at large. So that's my biggest hurdle. And I can imagine that it's not just my biggest hurdle. It's, it's a lot of people out here that are wondering, how in the world am I going to do this at the end last, next year? Because yep. like, this past year was hard. And so I think it's, it's a matter of us all coming together, offering the education, but also making sure that we're, that we're, that we're touching the people in their hearts and, and inspiring them so that they leave prepared with all the tools to be successful. Yeah, I love it. We um we do a GSD retreat, get shit done. <laughs> the <love> last <laughs> like the last month of the year, like the first week of every December, we go away somewhere 
and unplug for a week and we unpack like how did this year go mm-hmm. who did we love working with who did we not mesh so well with let's re pre-qualify who our client should be next year and of course you know we have things booked for the next year but when we go through that it helps us get stronger and better and more focused every single year of what we stand for and who we want to work with which is for us perfect timing because booking season with people getting engaged for like christmas and new year's and valentine's um you know we really our burnout oh my god like it every year if i didn't unpack everything and i'm like okay we cannot take clients who think that they know everything because they're coming to us as experts and I don't have the patience for it anymore. Um, And so I don't, I don't know if you've ever had to do this, but I mean, there have been times where I have to just go to a client and say, listen, this isn't going to work. Like we have a process, it works and clearly you don't fit into it. And so in, in terms of what you're looking for, I don't, I don't feel that I can make you happy. So I think it's best if you move on. Um, and they're like, are you firing me? And I'm like, hell yeah, I'm firing you. I mean, I don't say that, yeah, but absolutely. Like, I don't, it's not worth it. It's, it's not worth any amount of money to be miserable. And then when you're designing it and executing it, it's like, everybody's pissed off. And it's like, that's not the point of a wedding. No. So, I mean, have you ever had to turn oh. clients away and, oh. and tell yes. them like, go find yeah. somebody else? Yeah. Yes, you have. yes, I have. And let me tell you, um, we can chuckle about it after the fact, but there's nothing more disheartening than having yeah. to release a client from a contract. Um, you know, and I, 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 I was listening to um, some of the speakers at a recent conference, and the, one of the, the workshops was titled um, How to Fire a Client. And in the reality of the matter, and what I'm glad she brought, brought it to the forefront, is the best way to fire a client is to, to not have to fire them, never work with them. Right. So, so, you know, there's those red flags, there's those things that you see and you know and you hear, and, and you know that it's headed in a, a certain direction. But I know as creatives, you know, we never want to hurt anyone's feelings, and, you know, we want to, you know, honor our word, and we, we forego those red flags. And nine times out of ten, overwhelmingly, we see that we should have listened to our inner voice. Yep. And so I have had clients that I have had to let go. And, and I think that over the years, I've learned, you know, what are those traits? What are those signs that, it, that something's headed in the right direction, wrong direction? And so I'm glad that you do something similar to what we do. So we do um, every February or March, whenever the Philadelphia Flower Show is in town, um, we take a drive up, me and my team, and we go, go for a long weekend. And do something very similar where we process the year out and figure like, what are our non-negotiables now? And every year, thankfully, the non-negotiable list gets larger. And mm-hmm. we're able to hone in and work with people that, that are a better fit for us. Because, again, we're not chasing the money. We're chasing the experience and to be able to, to offer something special to someone. So just being very, very sensitive to those, those things. And, um, yeah, I hate to have to do it. And it doesn't happen often. But occasionally we do have to separate, you know, separate from a client. And, you know, when it happens, you know, I have a lot of anxiety about it for several Mm -hmm. days. Um, But then I have to trust my gut and know that, Bron, you know that you weren't the best fit for her. And 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 she'll benefit more from working with someone who who is able to accommodate her her unique needs. And if, if that person exists, then God bless them. Thank you so much for listening to another episode on Weddings Unveiled. Have a great day. Be sure to tune in to next week. Bye. If you found this podcast helpful, please share it with your friends. And I'm so very grateful if you will leave a review. Be sure you are a subscriber so you never, ever miss the juicy details of Weddings Unveiled. Also, be sure that you're a part of my email list. And if not, you can sign up at AngelaProfit.com where I share valuable resources and exclusive products with only my subscribers. Before I go, I want to ask you, if you have a story or a product to share with the wedding and event industry, please let me know. To be considered as a guest on Weddings Unveiled, visit AngelaProfit.com and submit a podcast guest form. Until next time, remember to stay productive and profitable.
You've been listening to Weddings Unveiled with Angela Profit. Join us next time for more insights to help you build a productive, profitable wedding or event business. For more great resources, head over to AngelaProfit.com.